And then finally, New Year's resolutions. Anybody do New Year's resolutions? No? So so? I forget about it. See, it was my, my aunt. Every year we got together for a Christmas or New Year's celebration. Every year she'd do a whole job. Aunt Carolyn. And she'd make us write all the New Year's resolutions down and we'd drop them into the jar. And then she would seal it and put it on the shelf. And come next year, we would open them and look back and say, hey, did we meet our goals over the past year? Were we able to do that? Did we do what we were supposed to do, what we said we were planning to do? Let's go to the next slide. What's that? Okay. So New Year's resolutions. Now, without raising hands, I saw some people raise hands with doing New Year's resolutions. To yourself, quietly, how many of you have ever broken a New Year's resolution? Made one, ah, <laughs> so I didn't go up. That's okay. How many of us have made a resolution and not kept it? There's a quote that says, many good plans die in the land of good intentions. Right? Uh, I had someone once tell me, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions don't finish it. Good intentions are great. We should have good intentions. But good intentions with poor planning, good intentions with poor execution, good intentions with poor follow through, good intentions with poor support, all of these things, it winds up just being good good intentions. You ever heard it when somebody lost, lost their lives or they gave into something and it took their lives and they say, wow, they always had such potential. Or even if a person's still alive and you see the way their life has turned out, they say, wow, you know, they always had such potential. It's so interesting that in science, potential energy stays potential energy until something gets it moving. And when something gets it moving, it becomes kinetic. I like kinetic. Kinetic energy is something that's moving with a purpose. What happens? Something engaged, something made to change, and now all of a sudden it's moving forward. So instead of potential energy, we've got to be kinetic. Next slide. I'm just going to say next, because I hate saying slot. <laughs> so finishing strong. Finish the race. It's never too late to finish strong. This is one of the biggest things that people find. When people are running a race and they get behind. When people are running a race and they get overwhelmed. You ever heard the hardest part? They say the hardest part is getting started. Right? It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Now once you get started... The hardest part sometimes is getting restarted. It's all a matter of just starting. No matter where you are, it's never too late to start. No matter where you find yourself, it's never too late to get up and get going. It's never too late to get up and engage. No matter what it may look like, no matter what it may feel like, no matter how overwhelming things may seem to be, the greatest win is the underdog. The greatest victory is when the underdog goes ahead and the underdog wins the race. I remember I did CrossFit with my brother one time. All right? I've only done CrossFit one time. And at the time, I was a chain smoker, right? I was ripping down like three packs of butts a day. And uh, I was so unhealthy, which I still like to eat. I like to eat back then, too. And my brother AJ had been doing like P90X. He did that for like three years. And then he did the insanity workouts for two years. And he'd been in uh, CrossFit for like two and a half years. I mean, same height as I was, like 60 pounds lighter, all shredded. And we did this workout called the Hero Workout. And it was in memory of the, the nine firefighters who passed away in that fire when the fire shifted. Okay? And the workout consisted of burpees, which is when you drop. I'm not going to do one. All right? You drop to the floor. You do a full push-up push. And then you jump yourself up and clap. And then you go back down again. So it's from a prone push-up, back up, jump, and then back down. So it was so many of those. It was so many pull-ups. It was so many, you, you, I don't know what it's called, but I think it's called, I call it a snatch, a clean snatch or a clean jerk, but you have the barbell here and you pick it up and then you catch it and then you, I'm not doing my forms awful, but then you go up with the bar over your head and then you drop it and you keep doing that. So many of those, and then it was 500 yard runs. Notice I didn't say run, I said runs. There were multiples. These were sets. And if I'm not mistaken, it was nine sets. It was one set for each firefighter. I was so out of shape. And on the last 500-yard run, see, we didn't, we just did it the right way, right? So your work is a team. It wasn't about one person finishing. It's about both of you finishing. 
My brother was stronger in areas that I was. I was going to blow my back out trying to lift that weight. I had no idea what I was doing. He was experienced in that. Pull-ups, I could do those. Burpees, I could do some, right? Oh, there's wall balls, too, where you there's like a 50-pound medicine ball, and you have to squat and pick it up, and then you throw it up the wall as high as you can. So we would do sets of these. And the last run, I was just gassed out. I literally had nothing left to give. There was a bunch of people who finished the race ahead of me. All right, these people who had been doing CrossFit for a while. I'll never forget, I'm running back. And they run back out to where I am. And they start running beside me. Come on, let's go. You got this, come on, you can finish. Listen, I found a little more wind in me when they did that. And when I went inside, all the others, there was a pregnant woman who had finished far ahead of me. And she's in there cheering me on. I'm like, listen, if she can do it, I can do it. When I went through the door, my legs gave out completely. I just collapsed on the floor, soaking in sweat. But listen, it didn't matter because I had finished. I could have said I, w I, I was disappointed because I didn't finish the way I wanted to. Praise God I even competed. Praise God I was able even, to, even able to get into the race. And when I finished, they didn't care about the things that I hadn't done. They cared that, listen, I had done the best that I could. I had pushed myself. I had done things that I normally wouldn't have done. And I had finished the race. It's not about so much how you start. It's all about how you finish. Finishing means so much. Thank you. Finishing means so much. So how do we run when we run a race? We run to win. All runners run to compete for a prize. But listen, there's only one prize that goes out. You know what they say? They say second place is the first loser. Right? In this race that we're in, there's only one prize. And there's only one way to win that prize. As Christians, we run to win. The issue is not that we win everything, but that we run as if to win. Run with purpose, not aimlessly. Paul says, I don't run like a man running aimlessly. I'm not just, you know, sometimes we just get caught running in circles and we don't really go anywhere. Right? If you're lifting weights every day the same way and nothing's changing, change the way you lift. If you're doing push-ups every day and you don't see anything changing, change the way you're doing push-ups. How? Ask somebody else. Talk to somebody else who may know better than you. Seek advice. Seek counsel. Seek instruction. Surround yourself with good people. Don't run aimlessly. If you find that you're running aimlessly and you're not going anywhere, guess what? Change the path a little bit. And I love this. There was a pastor that I, I love with all my heart. His name is Pastor Bert Pretorius, and he is wise beyond his years. And he said, you ever feel like you're trying to hit a post with a hammer and, and you just miss and dum? He's like, it just shocks your hands. And he's like, but then we go back and we try to hit the same way. Dum. And he said, sometimes all you need is just a little change. Sometimes it's just an inch. Sometimes we want to turn all the way around and we feel like we're making, and then we just dong again. He's like, just do a little change. Change a little something and see how that works. That was so encouraging for me as someone who felt like I could never hit the, hit the mark. When I realized, wow, I just change a little bit. Because I was trying to change so much I couldn't fulfill the commitment and then I just burn out. I'd have no energy. I'd just be gassed completely out because I was trying to change everything. Just change a little bit. Not aimlessly, turn a little bit and set your aim again. If you're off, you shoot again. When you buy a gun and you put a new scope on it, you don't just take it out and just go shooting with a new scope. You set a target, you fire at the target, where the bullet hits, you realize, wow, that's really off. You don't throw the gun away because the gun's off. You don't tear the scope off and trash it. You say, wow, that's off. And then you make the adjustments to the scope. Sometimes a click is a quarter inch at 20 yards. Turn it a quarter inch the top, turn it a quarter inch to the left or the right, make your adjustments, and keep shooting until you hit the mark. Don't fight like a man beating the air, not aimlessly. Set the goal, go for it. Training verse 25, it says, everyone who competes goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. So he's talking about all the people in this world that we see competing. Sometimes I, I just see them and I'm like, man, what are you really competing for, like, yay, you won. They're winning something that's temporal. It's good to win. It's good to have successes. And we should. Why? They're encouraging to us. They're encouraging to others. It keeps us in good shape. It keeps us 
pushing forward. It gives us positive goals and positive things to try and achieve. But honestly, everything in this life is temporal. But we as Christians, we're not, we're not waging a war for something temporal. What we're pushing on for is eternal. What does that mean? It's never going to die. It's never going to end. It's, it's never going to come to a ceasing or a stop being. So we're spiritually trained. We're not competing by an earthly rule, but eternal standards and rules. Just doing good and trying the hardest doesn't guarantee you a medal. We have to understand in this race, the race has already been won. Now when you say that, doing good doesn't win you a medal. That can be discouraging. But it's not intended to be. Be encouraged because the race is already won. All we have to do is follow in the steps of the one who went before us. Continue to move in that direction. And following the winner in this race is the only way to win. So we're going to talk this morning about spiritual training. All right, Training ourselves. I think this is very fitting coming to the end of 2020 because I see a lot of people who are gassed. I see a lot of people who are just burnt out. A lot of people who are just, you know, I just don't have anything left in me. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You can do this. You can finish, and you can finish strong. And I'm not the one that's telling you that. The Bible tells you that. God's Word tells you that. The Holy Spirit tells you that. The Scriptures tell you that. You can finish, and you can finish strong. The Bible even says this in one passage. It says, the end will be greater than the former. The end will be better than the former. Do we have that kind of a mindset, or have we just burned out? Do we have that kind of a mindset, or do we just feel like we're completely gassed out, completely empty? So, some of the ways that we can train ourselves to win. All right, don't just throw the rifle out when it doesn't hit where it's supposed to. Adjust it. How do we make adjustments? Pray. Pray daily. Philippians chapter 4 says, pray without ceasing. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41 says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The Spirit is willing. It's the Spirit of God in us that has a desire to do what needs to be done. The Spirit, all oh, listen, you ever get full of the Holy Ghost and you just feel like you can do anything? And then the next thing, the flesh comes in and you're like, Ah, oh, I just can't do it. The Bible says pray. Why? Because the Spirit is willing. The Spirit is able and willing to do what needs to be done. But the flesh, my God, that flesh is weak. So how do we overcome the flesh? Don't just say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. You can't do it on your own. That's the right way. But through the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do anything. Now, what's Paul talking about? He's, like, I'm, he's talking about being content in every situation. He's talking about no matter what comes down the pike, I can be okay. No matter what comes to me, I know that it's going to be all right. Why? Because... I can do anything through Christ in me who strengthens me. Don't worry so much about strengthening yourself. Worry about strengthening your spirit. Strengthen that inner man. Freddie Wheaton from Teen Challenge, he used to say, you know, sometimes I feel the old flesh creeping up on me and I just got to put on Christ. <laughs> and he did it like putting on a suit. And listen, we'll laugh about it, but I'll never forget that. He's like, listen, we have to put on Christ daily. We have to put on Christ. Daily we have to let the Holy Spirit come in and refresh us and renew us. Paul talked to Timothy. He said, fan into flame that gift that's there. A smoldering coal doesn't look like all that much. But you put a little breath on that thing. You put a little bit of air behind it. You begin to blow that thing. Listen, you can kindle a large fire from a small coal. Sometimes we just got to get that breath back into us. We got to get that spirit back into us. First Thessalonians says in 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for Christ Jesus in you. What's my purpose? You ever ask that question? What's my purpose? Rejoice always. Celebrate in everything. Pray without ceasing. And give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. It's His will for us to be in a position where no matter what happens, we can rejoice. No matter what happens, we pray without ceasing. Why? Because listen, situations come and they just knock the wind out of you. You ever get knocked down when you were a kid? You just get straight leveled and fall on your back and you're like, you just can't breathe? 
you freak out for a little bit, but after a while you begin to realize your body begins to come back, wow, I can still breathe. Okay. Take a breath. Reset. Pray without ceasing. Don't give up. Don't give in. Pray. 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 I don't feel like praying. Pray anyway. I don't feel like it's working. Pray anyway. I don't feel like I'm making any headway. Keep praying. Keep praying. How long do we pray? As long as it takes. How often do we pray? All the time. What do we pray about? Everything. Why do we pray? Because we have to. What happens if we don't pray? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If we don't pray, and we don't stay filled up, and we don't stay under the anointing, and we don't get covered by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost, what happens? The weakness of the flesh will overtake us. It will wear us down to nothing. Now that doesn't mean we go into a prayer closet and lock ourselves in for a 24-hour pray -athon. When we have a job to go to the next day, it means, listen, come sincerely with your heart. The Bible says, let your requests be made unto God with supplications, prayers, and thanksgiving. Bring your request to God. And then it says, once you've brought your request to God, the peace of God will come. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer is a natural thing that changes in the supernatural, the natural. Isn't that cool? So we pray. Study the Word. 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We have to handle the word of God. When? All the time. Why? Because we need it in our lives to fight off things. And other people need the word as well. But we have to correctly handle it. You go, I remember we, uh, we were kids. I'm still into knives. I like knives. Always have. I like Damascus steel, I think, is the prettiest knife that you can make. It, it's a really cool process if you get a chance to watch how it's made. But I had this next door neighbor, Bobby, who thought it'd be a great idea to get a butterfly knife. And if you've ever seen those, it's got two handles that fold and they close the blade inside. It's got a latch. And if you're good with them, they can do all kinds of really cool, like, flippy tricks with them. But most butterfly knives are dual-edged, so it has a sharp edge on both sides. Well, Bobby thought he was going to be a butterfly ninja master with the knife the first time he got it. And when he came to our house, his hand was covered in super glue because he had shredded his hand up. Look, he stuck it into a meat grinder. And listen, that's the thing. You can go around and pull out a knife and try to use it, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to cut yourself and you're going to cut somebody else. Oh, yeah, I remember that there was a gummy butterfly knife my friend had, and I was like, did for fun, and like, I don't like He's like, you do realize that that's real. You would have cut your hand off. I'm like, yeah, no, I know. I just like flipping it just for fun. I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's got my good thing is plastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a lot. Yeah, I would cut off my own. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? We can't just go around. The Bible says this, right? It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. How do we correctly handle the word of truth? We study it. What do we study it with? More scripture. Look at scripture in the light of scripture. If a verse comes out and that verse continues to beat you down, that's not the Lord. Take that verse and look for other verses. Go out of that one verse and look at it in the context. Study the word of God. Why? Because context is everything. A lot of people use that verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, to justify all kinds of stuff. Go back and look at the context. What was he talking about? He's talking about being content in all things. Right? Talking about being able to do everything, no matter what the situations or circumstances that came at him, he could do all things through Christ. Joshua 1.8. This is when they're establishing God's establishing his covenant with Joshua. He tells him, anywhere the sole of your foot touches, right? Joshua 1 8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it both day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful in all that you do. What's the first thing that we should do? What's the first thing we should think of? Where should our mind go? First is to the Word. If we find an issue, where should we go to find the answer? In the Word. If we're struggling, where should we go to find help? In the Word. If we're discouraged, where do we find encouragement? In the Word. We read the Word. We meditate on the Word. We study the Word. We get the Word into us. Discipline ourselves. All right? We hear this word discipline, and it can mean two things. Right? Discipline for me, I think back when I was a kid. I, I got all kinds of discipline. Right? Most of it I deserved. Uh, 
say probably actually more than all of it I deserve. I was a little hellion. And sometimes still can be. But the Bible's talking about disciplining ourselves. So what is discipline? Discipline is when something isn't right, something isn't working the way that it should, and either someone else or we ourselves make a correction to make it better. Simple enough, right? So when he's saying discipline ourselves, he's saying, listen, take a look at your life. Do an inventory. And when things are out of place, if, you, if we're not doing things that we should do, and we're doing things that we shouldn't do, discipline yourself. Give yourself a smack on the back. Give yourself a hand on the backside. Straighten yourself out. Figure out, okay, I'm not doing this. I should be. I shouldn't be doing this. I am. I'm going to discipline myself. Why? So nobody else has to. Isn't it awesome we discipline ourselves? Because if we don't, somehow, some way, we're going to get disciplined. One way or another, discipline's coming. We can't just do the wrong things and expect that nothing's going to happen. For, uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For the Spirit of God that God gave us does not make us timid, but it gives us power and love and self-discipline. Self-discipline. Self-control. What does that mean? It means if there's no self-control, there's a reason why there's no self-control. What's the reason? The Spirit's not active. That's all it is. It's the truth. Paul said, the things that I find myself doing are the things that I don't want to do. And the things that I don't want to do are the things that I do. I don't do what I want, but I do what I don't want. I see that there's something at work in me, these two things. The flesh and the spirit. And then Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus said, the way to fix that is to pray. Prayer is a discipline. The spirit of God gives us discipline. What does that mean? That means that the more the spirit of God is in control in our lives the more self-control we'll have. The more we'll be able to avoid temptation. The more we'll be able to say, yeah, my flesh is weak, but the Spirit of God in me is strong. Proverbs 13, 1. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a mocker does not respond to rebukes. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and don't resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father... The son, he delights in. So basically what he's saying is we can get upset. We get all wounded when God disciplines us sometimes. Oh, God, why would you do that? He's like, because I want what's best for you. Why would you hurt me like that? Well, I'd rather hurt you a little bit now than have you hurt for eternity. Why, were you, why, why would you do that to me, God? You allow me to go through that. Well, a lot of time, a lot of the things that God allows me to go through are things that I put myself in. I put myself in a situation. I allow myself to be in a circumstance. When the circumstance doesn't go well, it's God's fault. God, why did you do that to me? That's not always the case. But when God does something to us, we have to, you know, the song this morning, you're a good, good father. Is God a good father? Has he always been a good father? Will he always be a good father? Yeah. If he's a good father, he always has been and he always will be, then when he disciplines us, he's disciplining us as a good father. He's doing it for a purpose. Why? Because he wants what's best for us. He always wants what's best for us? Do we want what's best for us? What's best for us? What he wants. Do we want what he wants? Or do we want what we want? We'll find out what we want when we don't get it. If we don't get what we want, we get sour. But if we get what we want, and what we want is him, the outcome is always beautiful. That's just a bunch of words, right? God, what did he just say? He just went all around. But listen, do we really want what God wants? Amen. Is the joy of the Lord our strength? Is what God desires the most important thing in our lives? Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. It speaks about all the things that our lives get shaken over. What do our lives get shaken? It's always the same. Money. Clothing, a place to live, right? All those simple things. And God says, listen, even the birds have a place to lay their heads at. They don't even really worry about it all that much. They, it's provided. No matter where a bird goes, they're going to find something to make a nest out of. No matter where they are, they can find a place to make a home. Foxes, they don't have to go build nests at homes. They just find a spot that's pretty much already ready, and they just go in and fix it up a little bit. God says the lilies of the field, they come up, they're beautiful, more beautiful than Solomon in all his glory and splendor. 
if God dresses them that way, how much more us? If God provides for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the flowers, how much more will God provide for us? Aren't you worth more than a flower to God? Aren't you more? Absolutely you are. We're the most highly esteemed thing that God has made. Imagine that. You are the most precious thing that God has made. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. It says that before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. My mama used to say that God just had to have an Alan. He wasn't satisfied with all the others. He had to have an Alan. God had to have a Jody. He had to have a Janine. He had to have a Josh and a Jane and an Evelyn. He just couldn't be satisfied without it. You're not a mistake. Nothing in your life is a mistake. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. What does that mean? That means that God handcrafted you. Every single part of you was made exactly the way that God intended it to be. You were crafted in the image of God, and God doesn't make mistakes. And knowing that, we have to be willing to discipline ourselves and correct ourselves and bring ourselves back into these things. What is discipline? Discipline is I read in the Word of God that it says that I should be doing something. I discipline myself to do it. I read in the Word of God that it says that I shouldn't be doing something. I discipline myself not to do it. If I find that I continue to do it, what does that mean? That means that I pray and study more. Why? Because that means my flesh is strong in that area. And sometimes it's not just my flesh. Sometimes there's spiritual things that take place as well. Sometimes there's demonic influences and powers and principalities and things that are over us. But God says that's already taken care of too. You don't have to worry yourself out getting punch drunk on demons. Okay? Jesus didn't go in and have arguments and conversations with him. When Jesus went in, he spoke the word of God. He spoke it in truth. He knew what he was saying. It was in him. He already had it in him. He had already prepared. He was already prayed up, fasted up, studied up. He was ready for it when it came. He actually went out expecting to encounter them. And when they came, they usually called him first. Son of God, back up. If we're ready, when we walk out, we won't have to go looking for the fights. They'll come to us, and when they come, guess what? It'll be a victory every time. Some fights are tougher than others. Why? Because we're not Jesus. Jesus is in us, but he saved us from sin when he lived without sin. But the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive and at work in you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are spiritually anointed and empowered, and you are equipped with everything that you need to live a successful life in Godliness. But we have to discipline ourselves with what's been given to us. If I go into a gym and they equip me with the entire gym, they say, hey, you have all the weights, you've got the treadmill, and I just sit back and say, wow, praise God, you know, I've got all these weights and things, I'm feeling stronger already. Right? And nothing ever changes. Guess what? Who cares if I have the gym? Who cares if I have all the stuff to do it? If I don't use the stuff that God has given me, if I'm not working it, it's never going to change. And what happens when you work it? God, it hurts. I don't like lifting weights. Why? Because I don't like the pain that comes after me. Who does? Honestly, who enjoys the discipline? But when you're thinking about the end goal, when you're thinking about the prize that's available, that gives you some encouragement. I didn't want to finish that race when I was running. But you know what gave me encouragement? People coming alongside me and saying, you can do this. And I realized, wow, I can finish this. I just wanted to lay on the pavement out in the driveway. I was that close to finishing. I wanted to just give right up. But when I finished that cross line, that was a tip. I didn't win anything. I got no prize. But listen, the prize that I got from that carrying it away, I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Knowing that I was able to finish that. When we finish one race, we can finish another. Verse 27. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what it should. Think of all the best athletes. A good athlete not only works hard, but the best athletes are willing to make changes if they're needed. I think one of the biggest struggles in the church sometimes is that we say, well, it's always the way it's been done. That's always the way we've done things. Well, listen, if the way that you do things doesn't work, then maybe you should change that. And that's not just you. If the way that we are doing things doesn't work, then we have to make a decision to change what we're doing. We can't be rigid. We can't be stuck in old things and old ways. Now listen, there are some things that just work. I don't see any need to change those unless the Holy Ghost tells us to. But it doesn't mean that we can't always and shouldn't always be looking for ways to improve things. 
The Apostle Paul didn't reach a certain spot and say, well, I'm there. No. Even when he was serving the Lord, he got convicted of new things. God showed him new things in his life that he needed to change. Why? Because as we grow, we should constantly be changing. Everything else is. It takes a lot for us to keep up with the way that things are changing. We can sit back and fold our hands and say, I can't move forward. But if we're not trying to move forward, what's the point of saying that? If we're not doing what we need to do to get ourselves beyond our circumstance and situation, that's nobody else's problem but ours. It's nobody else's fault but mine. If I sit with my hands folded and I say that I can't get out of this, I just can't do it, I just can't change, if I'm doing that, then guess what? It's nobody else's fault but mine. Now listen, you bring me somebody who says, hey listen, I'm trying to get out of this. This is what I'm doing. I got you, man. We'll team up and we'll go together. But we're going to get to it. Hallelujah. I'm getting ahead of myself. No, nope, go back, go back. No, nope, sorry. So, they're willing to make the change if needed. They're not blind to the training. They're stubborn, but flexible and willing to change as needed. See, it's really cool. Like, you talk about learning things. So, they say to be an expert in anything, it takes a thousand hours. A thousand hours to be an expert. Nobody starts as an expert. And everything is different. Every body is different. Just because someone trains a certain way doesn't mean that me training that way is going to produce the same results. Why? Because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm different than you. Praise the Lord, you're different than me. So the way that I live, maybe I can teach you a couple things. And the way that you live, maybe you can teach me a couple of things. And maybe once it's all said and done, we can help each other be the best Christians that we can be. Because at the end of the day, I'm not trying to reproduce me, and you shouldn't be trying to reproduce you. We should be trying to reproduce the nature and character of Christ. What does Christ do? Christ brings each individual into the best that they can be. Why? Because everybody else is different. They need your testimony and my testimony. They need your past and my past. They need your experience and my experience. That's what the body says. The Bible says that we're a body. There's heads and feet and toes and arms and hands. But a good athlete recognizes that he can't always be a foot. He's got to be a hand some days. He can't always be a hand someday. Some days he's got to be a butt. Nobody wants to be a butt. But listen, it's necessary. We have to have it. Are we willing to look for what's needed and to fill that spot? And are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to show us where we should be for a while? God tells us, hey, I need you to be a butt for a while. And we're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'd rather be a hand. I'm just going to go be a hand. I didn't hear that, God. I don't want to be a butt. you got to be a foot for a while. Nah, I'd rather be an eye. I think I like being an eye better. A good athlete is someone who recognizes where the change needs to happen and makes the change. They're not stuck on being one thing and one thing only. They're versatile. I think of Tom Brady, right? Tom Brady in his A game, in his best years, it wasn't just about his ability to throw a ball. Who cares if you can throw a ball? It's about his ability to throw a ball under pressure to find the moving targets, to, to play the whole field. And guess what? Sometimes you can't throw. What do you got to do? You got to defend. You run back. You drop back, right? You, you got to reposition. Sometimes you can't do that. You got to run it in yourself. Well, I don't want to run it in. It's not my job. I've got other guys to do that. That's fine. Then you can lose by standing still. That's what it boils down to, right? Are we willing to do what it takes to win? Or are we willing to be okay sitting back and losing? It takes discipline to win. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to be flexible to make the changes when needed. Next slide. Make the body a slave to Christ. Okay, some translations say that we have to buffet our body. That doesn't mean buffet, all right? Just, I thought that was pretty funny, right? Don't buffet your body, all right? I, I'm guilty of this one. Um, but balance, right? Keep it in between the check. I think of the bumper lanes when you're bowling. If you're not a good bowler, throw the buffer lanes out for a while until you get good. And when you're done with that, take those buffets off and put in another one. Work on spinning the ball, whatever it is. Make yourself more successful. Constantly bounce it back where it needs to go. Next slide. Okay, specifics. These are some specific ways that we can go into the new year running as to get the prize. New year's not over yet. Don't sit back and fold your hands and say, well, 2020 is done. It is what it is. If you do that, then absolutely it is. If you sit back and fold your arms and say, well, it's not going to change, there's still days left. 
there's always time left. Don't be guilty of sitting back and folding your hands. Again, I think of Tom Brady, right? And I'm not going to get him a Patriot sermon here, but you've got to give credit where credit is due. He's the greatest quarterback of all time. And they were always a fourth-quarter team. I used to hate it so bad watching them because the first three quarters you'd be pulling your hair out like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, could you at least score a few points and make it close? And it would be these landslides. And then in the fourth quarter, all of a sudden, it's like a switch happened. It didn't matter. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter how the first three quarters were played. The fourth quarter is what matters the most. What if we lived every day like it was the fourth quarter? What if we recognize, because it is, the Bible says tomorrow is not promised. It says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. We've got to live every day like it's the fourth quarter. Every day like we're up against the wall, like we're losing, but like there's a chance for victory. See, they never gave up. Did it always work for them? No, absolutely not. Work for them a lot of the time. Now, when it did, guess what? Everybody's like, oh, they were losing, but look, they won. It's crazy. Some people get mad. Some people get happy. But it doesn't matter how people felt. What matters is they won. And they won by working hard. The fourth quarter is the hardest part of the game. Why? Because you've already been playing for three quarters. You've been running back and forth. And if you're losing, it's even harder. Why? Because you look at the scoreboard and you're like, man, I can't win this thing. How am I supposed to win this thing? We're down by so much. You know what? I'm just not even going to play. Fantastic. Then the results will be the same. You're already losing. You lost. Turn it around. Look at it through the eyes of victory. Reevaluate this year. Reevaluate towards the end of the year. Reevaluate what? Everything we do for the spiritual. A good athlete's willing to take a look at why they do what they do. It's always been this way as something that isn't looking to win. It's looking to stay comfortable and secure. A winner could care less about being comfortable. Why? Because it hurts to win. It's painful to win. We sacrifice to win. Tom Brady sacrifices all kinds of stuff. What do we sacrifice to win? What are we giving up in our lives to make sure that we're successful in Christianity? What comforts are we giving up? What time are we giving up? What energy are we investing? What things are we letting go of? So, first off is looking at what we do. Second off, Oh, why do I do this? So why do I do what I do? You ever ask yourself that question? I find that I don't ask myself that question enough. I just do things sometimes. And then I'll stop and be like, wait a minute. Why did I just do that? Sometimes we do things just out of repetition. Sometimes we do them out of comfort. Sometimes we do them out of anxiety. Because we don't really know what to do. It just becomes a response. But you discipline yourself over time. Think about my friend Aaron Bertzel. He's like a seventh degree black belt. And he doesn't practice anymore. But he said that he did it so much. He's like, when I walk into a room, even now, he's, he's a born again Christian, full of the Holy Ghost. Guy is phenomenal. He's a powerhouse for the Lord. And he is so humbling to be around. But his, his original thing before he came into Christ was he was a, a leg breaker for the Dominicans. If you didn't pay your money, he'd come looking for it. And he trained himself on how to be a black belt. He said, when I look at a person, I can see like 15 different things that I could do to take you back. And he's like, I don't even think about that anymore, but I just did it so much that it's just a part of me. That's the discipline. But in order to do that, we have to stop. We really have to re-gauge ourselves, and we have to try and figure it out. Nobody goes into martial arts and gets it right the first time. My brother AJ's in martial arts, jiu-jitsu. He doesn't even have the strike yet. And he just snapped his finger in half, and it rolled. His finger got caught in somebody's knee, and it broke him. He didn't give up. He got pens put in his finger. His finger's work, he's going to go back and keep training. Why? Because there's still a goal ahead. There's still a prize that has to be won. He's not satisfied with where he is. Why do we do what we do? Hey. Oh, sorry. Uh, you're okay. It's like magic. Why do you do what you do? Yeah. <laughs> no, she said it first. That was good. Amen. See? So Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? That means, again, listen, we're all saved and we're all called to the same purpose and the same goal. But the Holy Spirit has specific things that need to take place in your life. He has specific things that need to take place in my life. We have the same struggles in some areas. But in some areas, God has to work something out with you. Don't be so quick to slap somebody else's salvation on you and think it's okay. Well, I'm saved because my daddy told me. Well, I'm saved because my mommy told me. 
No, you're saved because of the Word of God told you. And if you don't have that Word of God in your life, and it's not a personal relationship, you can't skate to heaven on my coattails, and I can't skate to heaven on yours. It's a personal relationship. I have to be in constant communication with God. It says work it out with fear and trembling. It doesn't sound like joy and peace. But that means, listen, we should be so dedicated to working it out that we should recognize that salvation... There's a verse that there's, there's a group of people that say once saved, always saved. My Bible does not say that. I do not find verses that say once saved, always saved. I find verses like this that say work out your salvation. It's a process. I find verses where Paul says run as if to finish the race so that you won't be disqualified. We can be disqualified. We have to work as if we're going to be disqualified. We have to work as if we think there's a possibility we could be disqualified. What does that do? That changes the way we play. If you think you've already won, you're not going to play that hard. Right? I've already got this. Sit right back and go. <laughs> I know. Listen, that's not a victory. That's, that's how uh, I get more of this. Right? <laughs> Next slide. Next. All right. Remember, it's a team win. We hear this verse, and he says, I run. I run. I run. I run. But again, who was he talking to? He's talking to his church. Why? Because his church was struggling. He's telling them, hey, I run. So we should run. No one wins alone. How do they get there? Trainers, support, teammates. No greater blessing than being able to share what is taught and turn training up the next winner. They say the ultimate success in life is to bring someone else into success in life. The greatest joy is taking the things that we've learned for good and then seeing someone that we've trained up step into that role and succeed in that role. I want my daughters to succeed. I think about you, right? Your son. And I'm going to use her as an example. Her son went into the military. And the military wrote her a letter and said, I want to tell you that I know you've done a good job parenting. Listen, I would wear that with a badge of honor. That would make me so proud. When people come to me and say, wow, your girls are really good. Your girls are well-behaved. I'm like, yeah. If they say they're not well-behaved, I'm like, yeah, they take after their mom. But if they, uh... <laughs> no. Well, listen, that's the greatest success is training up someone else. The greatest success is pouring into someone else. And listen, a person will never succeed more than when they see you succeed and fail. It's not about how you always win. We're always worried about people seeing us win. Just see my wins. Who cares? I want to see your failures. I want to see your mistakes. I want to see your mess-ups. Why? Because if I can see your mess-ups, I know you're real. I don't want to be around somebody who's perfect. Why? Because it makes me feel bad. I know I'm not perfect. And I know it's not true. I know that nobody's perfect. I could care less about all the successes. People got walls of accolades. Who cares? Doesn't mean a thing. They're all going to burn anyway. I got treasure trunks full of accolades in my house from all my family members who accomplished great things, but they're all dead. You know, they're not around anymore. My favorite stories are the ones when they said, this is where I messed up, but I'm telling you this so that you won't have to make the same mistake. See, that's an investment. That's an investment that I want to listen to. Tell me what you did wrong so that I can miss it. Don't tell me what I'm doing wrong all the time. Don't tell me what you're doing right all the time. Who cares? I want to see what you're doing wrong. Let's fix it. Right? Make sense? In order to train, we must still be training. Makes sense? You know, again, you can't sit down and say, I'm training. It doesn't work that way. Either you're training or you're not. And if you're not training, it shows. If I'm not lifting weights, it shows. Right? If I'm curling drumsticks and cheesecake, it shows. And listen, I, I enjoy curling drumsticks and cheesecake. I'm training for a different kind of Olympics. So, not saying that I've already achieved this. Paul says this, that he's still training, he's still pushing. He's still saying that he was competing. And he's saying to his church to remind them to compete and to go together. Next slide. Next thing we should ask, so what am I doing? Why do I do it this way? What am I doing, but why do I do it this way? Why do I pray the way I do? Why do I read the way I do? Listen, if we prayed the same way for years constantly the same format over and over and over again, why not change it up? Try something different. There's no right way or wrong way. God says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Pray. If you pray quiet all the time, try praying out loud. If, you, if you've never really fasted before, try fasting. 
if you don't like praying with people, try praying with people. You want to talk about breaking some stuff down. Get with somebody else and lay hands on them and let them pray over you when you pray over them. Pray together and watch what happens. Change the way that you pray. Work on it. Why? Because we're constantly growing. To think there's only one way to pray and we know it, that's kind of crazy. And those kinds of teams don't win. I think of Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward was a very successful business. And then other businesses started coming out with online shopping. Montgomery Ward CEO said, you know what? We're never going to change. I will never go to online shopping. And he was right. They never went anywhere. They went bankrupt. Yeah. Why? Because things changed. Yeah. And they weren't willing to change. They said, we've always done it one way. We're always going to do it that way. That's fine. Montgomery Ward is a memory now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazon, on the other hand, they said, how can we succeed? What must we do in order to succeed? They're constantly changing the way they're doing things. They try things. If they don't work, guess what? They pull it and move on. And that's how they stay at the top. We're much more than Amazon. The church, we're much more valuable than Amazon is. We're much more important than a package being delivered to somebody's home. How much more should we be doing the same thing? Does the Bible say be one thing for everybody, or does it say be all things to all people? Some people pray different ways. Some people read different ways. Why can't we just listen and practice and learn and train? A trainer learns new things. God's not rigid, and neither is a good athlete. We always have to be willing to allow God to do new work in us. If we've been reading the Bible the same way for years, look at a reading program that's different. Look at new devotions. And if we haven't memorized scriptures, start memorizing scriptures. Start memorizing scriptures. Look into the words. Pray about it and ask God to do, you know, ask God to show you, but don't sit and wait forever for him to give you a verse. Okay? If, if you can go to the back of the Bible. It's really simple. All the Word is good. It's good to have it in you. Go to the back of the Bible and pick a word. Love, joy, peace, patience, weakness, anxiety, frustration, anger, pride, selfishness, whatever it is. Find that Word. It'll give you all the scriptures next to it. Get one of those scriptures, put it on the cue card, read it throughout your day. Just get it into you. There's no wrong way to study scripture. No wrong way to memorize any one of it. And then as you begin to do that, the Holy Spirit will start to bring those back to you. He'll even give you verses you haven't even read yet. That blows my mind. When I'll hear something, I'm like, I know I've heard that before. But I haven't heard that before. And then I go and I look and I find it. It's in the Bible. That is so cool. I don't think I've ever even read that before. It's awesome. Next slide. We're going to wrap this thing up. Psalm 119, 11. He says, I have hidden your word inside my heart that I might not sin against you. Get the word inside of you and it will manifest on the outside. David said, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does that mean? That means the word in our lives, when we memorize it, we meditate on it, we get it in us. It makes it so what comes out of us is not sin. And what's in us is not sin. David said, I, I hide your word in my heart so that I would not sin against you. What does that mean? That means it's conditioning the spirit and conditioning the flesh to obey the spirit. Okay? Next slide. The next thing we can do is renew our commitment. How often is this important? Daily. Weekly. Monthly. Yearly. Set goals. Again, set small ones. I'm going to read for, if you can't read for an hour, read for a half an hour. Would, would you like to read for an hour? Absolutely. But you'll never read for an hour if you don't read for half an hour. Make a goal to read five minutes. Hey, five minutes is better than no minutes. But remember that five minutes isn't where you stay. Right? When you've got five minutes down pat, okay, I've got this. I can do another five minutes. And before you know it, you're reading full days, 24 hours a day, nonstop. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Renew your commitment to doing those things that truly expose us to more God, more of His wisdom, more of His love, and just more of Him overall. 1 Kings 8, 61 says, And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord, to live by His decrees, and to obey His commands as at this time. Fully committed. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. A worker who correctly handles the truth. Next. Run to finish. Something exciting. And something exciting to start something new. But the new wears off. right? They call it the honeymoon phase. You get saved. Praise the Lord. I love this. It's such a good life. And the honeymoon goes away. We realize, wow, there's commitments here. And the commitments are really where it starts to struggle. Right? But we have to remember that it's, it's, we're running to finish. 
not a jump start where we just pick up and go, how many people do we see get up and burn out? How many marriages do we see failing? How many people do we see getting divorced? How many families do we see falling apart? I didn't know it was going to be this way. Well, listen, it doesn't matter. You committed to it being anyway, no matter what, anyway. Run to finish. Discipline, hard work, commitment, and follow through. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves. Amen. Say that. Amen. They devoted themselves. Amen. They devoted themselves. Amen. Daily. There it is. One more time. They devoted themselves. Amen. Daily. <laughs> Daily. To the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Breaking of bread is communion. They did communion daily. Why? Keep the heart clean. Not to be in a church to do communion. You do it at home. Ask the Holy Spirit to search you and forgive you. Do communion you commun with your family. Break bread at your table. Break bread in your house. Why? Because listen, you can't hide when you do a communion. You can't hide anything. The Bible says to even come to God and do that, we have to be prepared. There can't be anything wrong in us because to do it is literally just to take a curse on yourself. Man, I'll make you clean your house up. Ooh. Hallelujah. So how can we finish this year? Wrap up strong. Spend the last week of this year in earnest prayer. God asking him to show us areas we still need to consecrate and dedicate to him. Psalm 139, verse 23. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know the source of my anxiety. See if there's any wicked way in me. The Holy Spirit identifies things in us that we can't identify on our own. We need God to search us. We need God to find us. We need God to help us to understand. I'm not a mechanic in everything. I can figure some things out, but some things I have to go get searched out. I know the basics. I can figure out if my car is knocking when I start it up. It's a lifter. Maybe it's low on oil. Maybe it's worse. First thing I do is check the oil. If that doesn't work, what do I do? I move on to the next thing. If that doesn't work, what do I do? I go see a mechanic. Allow the mechanic to tell you what's wrong. He built the car. He knows what's going on. He knows how to fix it. Allow him to identify it and then allow him to fix it. Next slide. Ask and allow. See? How about that? Ask and allow. Ask God to show you the specific areas that we can reevaluate, rearrange, and renew, and then allow him to do them. He wants more than you do for you to win. You have to know this. Sometimes we don't believe that God wants us to win. We're in this mindset that God just set us up to fail. Here we go, God. One more failure. One. Listen, that is such a lie from the pit of hell. That's a discouraging spirit over your life. That's it, it will never bring you to victory. You have to understand that God wants you to win. How do I know that? Because he wants you to win. He wants you to win. He already went across the finish line for you. He made the way for you to win. He's on the other side of the finish line calling you to win. When you're winded and you can't make it, he comes back and runs alongside you and says, keep going, keep going, keep going. You've got this. You can do this. Why? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. It says that he's long-suffering, not desiring that anyone should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. There's a prize to be won. He already won the prize. Now it's up to us to win. We have to win. He wants us to win. Do we want to win? That's the question. Constant accountability, or contact and accountability part. This is just a good word of advice. Find someone to keep you accountable. If you've got things that you're struggling, give us somebody. Make it somebody outside of your family. Your family already knows you pretty good. Make it someone with an abstract eye. Uh, one of my accountability partners, one of the things that I absolutely hate about him, but it's something I absolutely love about him, is that he can see right through me. She knows what I'm talking about. I can tell him something, and he'll call me back in five minutes and say, listen, what you just told me is not true. You want to be honest with me? The Holy Spirit has given him the ability of discernment. And as long as I've known him, he has always been willing to call me on my mess. When I call him to talk to him about something, he will immediately put it right back on me. If I'm calling to complain about somebody else, he'll immediately, sometimes I don't want to call him because of that. But listen, that's a good accountability partner. You don't want to surround yourself with yes men. The bottom right here, it says a team of yes men don't win. They say yes, 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 and lose. We want somebody who's going to say no. Why? Because only a real person will tell you no if they really love you. A real person who loves you will tell you no. A real person who's concerned with your best interest will tell you, don't do that. I'm going to let my kids run around the house and do whatever they want. Why? Because they'll cut their hands off. They'll stick things in the outlets and get electrocuted. I tell them no. They don't like to hear no. Why not? Because I'm taking something away from them. But I really want them to succeed. 
Find someone who wants you to succeed more than they want you to be comfortable. Sound good? Next slide. Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross its scorning and its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Next. Man, i got to wrap this up. Cast off every weight. See, weights aren't always sins. Hello? Weights aren't always sins. Some Weights are just things that hold you back. What things are we doing that just hold us back? That's a good question. What things are we allowing in our lives that just hold us back? Casting off some. Casting off every weight. Casting off all weights. And the sin. What things are we doing that aren't necessarily a sin, but they just, they're not getting us where we need to go? They're holding us back. Cast off every weight. Go back. Cast off every weight. Now you're scratching your eye. Weights are necessary to train. Sometimes God allows weights to come in there. But listen, let him sort that out. Let him sort that out. But if you know there's things that are holding you back, let them go. People don't carry weights all day, every day. You train for a season, then you put the weights down and you move on. Right? Let God identify. Be willing to identify yourself. And he and you get rid of them. Oftentimes we pray and pray and pray and we say, God, do this. God, do that. God, show me this. God, show me that. And God's like, dude, just open your own eyes for a little while. Like, I gave you eyes. I gave you a brain. You're a pretty smart person. You're not doing things that you should be doing. You can pray for me to show you all day long, but until you start doing your part, I'm not going to do my part. That's the truth. There's an expectation. Work out your own salvation. Study to show yourself approved. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean pray for God to change things over and over again that we're not willing to change ourselves. Make sense? Next slide. Fix our eyes on Jesus. In order to finish, we must have a goal, a sight, set in the end. A winner is someone who keeps the end in mind because otherwise the in-betweens take up the view. If you're in a competition, right, and you're running, and all you can see is the competition that's in front of you, and you lose sight of the goal, man, it just wears you down a little I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. No, you look at the goal so that you can see how far you've come. They say if you're driving, you always fix your eyes ahead of you, you'll never get into an accident. It's true. Because when you're looking ahead, you're seeing everything. But if you focus down in front of you, you're likely to hit something that you're not going to see. And then it'll take you out of the race. Fix your eyes on Jesus. There's a long way to go. Well, you've already come a long way. Fixing your eyes on Jesus will help you to see how far you've come and how far you need to go so that you don't lose sight of the prize and you don't get caught up on the things in between. We need to look beyond the temporal and to the eternal and see him who already won for us. He is our winner and he is the prize. Next. This is the last slide. Closing on Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Know dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Finish out your year like this. Forgetting the past, and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Forgetting the former things, I fix my eyes on the prize. I fix my eyes on the prize, and I push forward, casting off every weight, every sin, every struggle, every failure, every worry, every doubt, every fear. I fix my eyes on Jesus. I press on to reach and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. For which God in Christ Jesus is calling you. Today, if you're discouraged coming into the end of this season, if you're discouraged coming into 
uh, the beginning of a new season, if you're just discouraged all around, then listen, I, the altars are open this morning. Come pray. Come get with the Lord. If you want to make your altar at your seat, that's fine. Wherever you are, just pray this morning. We're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. If you have to go, go. If, if you can stay, stay. Um, but listen, just get with the Lord this morning and let Him, you know, we, we, we have to be willing to get rid of weights. If, if I've got a weight in my hand right now, I'm like, God, this thing is so heavy. Take it from me. Right? Dude, this thing is so heavy. Dude, take it from me. I'll just take it. Yeah, you just got to take it. Yeah, go ahead. Come on. You can take it. Just take it. Yeah, come on. You got this. Take it, God. Just take it away from me, God. Right? If I'm holding on to it with a death grip and I'm asking God to take it from me, He's not going to take it from me. I have to say, God, take this from me. And then be done with it. Yeah, right? If we're not willing to give it, then we can't expect Him to take it. Oftentimes we expect Him to do all the work. Take it, God. Take it. Take it. He wants to. He literally said, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, all you who are burdened and weighed down, and I will give you rest for your souls. But if we labor constantly and we're not willing to give over the reins, if we're constantly working and we're not willing to surrender, it's surrender that brings the peace. We have to be willing to surrender. We say, God, here's my life. Take it, God. You know, And then we, here's my life, God, take it. And then we're like, yeah, take my life, God. You know? We just keep going the opposite direction. We keep doing what we want to do. And then we just expect that God's going to do some miraculous change for us. It doesn't work that way. We have to be willing to surrender it. We have to be willing to allow Him to take it. When we give it to Him, we have to let it go. And when we do that, we begin to experience peace. Peace comes in the surrender to the will of God. Surrender to God's plans and purposes for your life and for my life. We have to pray and let God show us what needs to go. And then we have to obey it. We have to be willing to let it go. Let what go? Anything. Casting off always. And also. Everything that so easily ensnares us. If it becomes a trip up in our lives, it's got to go. If it's become a stronghold in your life, it's got to go. You have to let it go. Let it go so that you can finish the race strong. Cast off the weights. Why? Because God said where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You're free from those weights. The Bible says don't be entangled again by a yoke of slavery. God already broke the yoke. He already stripped all the chains. You're free through the blood of Jesus. You're free through faith and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Don't be a slave again to anything. If something's making you a slave, get rid of it. Cast it off and be refreshed and renewed by the Word of God and through His Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's close with prayer today. Wherever you are, as we're closing with prayer, just go to God honestly with whatever it is that you're facing. Be honest with Him. Tell Him what you're struggling with and ask Him to help you take it. But be willing to get rid of it. Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you for the word of God that is true. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement that you encourage us with. Thank you for reminding us this morning. Thank you for reminding me this morning, God, that we can do this. You didn't call us to something, God. Just to fail. It's your name that's at stake. You're the one that put your name at stake on the victory. And God, your name is always glorified. I pray, Father, that you would help us. I pray that you would help us to overcome. I pray that you would help us to offload and to discard all weights. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would search us in the days as they come to the end of this year, as we bring it to a close, that you would search us, God. And I pray that you would even help us to search ourselves, to see the things that need to change, and to have the courage and the wisdom, God, to change them. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we bring this service to a close and as we're bringing this season to a close, Father, that you would just meet each person right where they are. Meet each person in their need, in their struggle, in their worry, in their doubt, and in their fear, God, and bring them to the place that you're calling them to be. 
bring them to the victory, God. I pray, encourage them, strengthen them, God. All those who are weak, all those who are discouraged, bring healing, restoration, Father. We just thank you for it. Bless each person, God, those here and those who may be watching this morning. We thank you for all that you are, God, all that you've done. We thank you for all that you are doing. We commit it to you, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray today. Amen. Amen. God bless.